Hello, welcome to Winter Rosa Apiaries.
So the way you behave affects your exposure to disease, it affects disease transmission. Um, it also predicts susceptibility to disease in some cases. So there are a lot of examples where you can actually measure behavior and determine the um, risk that individual has of expressing disease symptoms if they're exposed. So we've recently shown in the honeybee, for example, that um, low aggression bees tend to be more susceptible to disease if they're exposed to a disease. Uh, they're also uh, more likely to die when they're exposed to a pesticide. Uh, so in that case, behavior is actually predicting their response. But behavior and disease are linked in the opposite way as well. So when you're sick, you change your behavior. Uh, this is, again, an intuitive example of a sick child. Um, honeybees are the same way. We've shown that infection decreases aggressive behavior. Um, and there are a lot of ways you could, have, you could imagine that disease alters behavior in the honeybee, and rotting actually ties into that as well. So these are the kind of themes that we're interested in the lab. So if you understand how behavior is regulated, you can understand how health uh, is also impacted by some of those same processes. So the honeybee, um, we do have a lot of evidence that social behaviors impact disease resistance and transmission. So who is getting exposed to a disease depends on um, the social organization of the colony. So foragers, for example, leave the hive, they can come in contact with other bees from neighboring colonies and pick up diseases in those ways. Um, the way that diseases are transmitted throughout the hive also has a social element. So for example, uh, nurse bees are the adults that feed larvae. They're coming in contact with the young. Um, and so that is a social interaction that could be associated with disease transmission. <coughs> so this gives you a kind of general picture of um, the relationship between health and disease, which I'll touch on in the context of robbing. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the scope of the lab. I wanted to stay focused on robbing behavior. So what about this word integrative? Um, integrative approaches to behavior and health basically just means that we take a lot of research angles in the lab to understand behavior and health. I've given you some examples already. Um, but so, for example, we're interested in how behaviors evolve, how they come to be over time, and their functions in the environment. Also, how they're impacted by the environment. Um, when you think about the kind of brain side of the equation, how does the brain control behavior? And how do behaviors impact immune function? So physiology of the organism that predicts um, their response to disease. So I'm going to cover a little bit of everything today. Um, our sort of philosophy in the research lab is that investigating all of these different angles really gives us the best chance at um, doing things like improving body bee colony health. Okay, so I mentioned that a lot of the uh, behavioral research we do in the lab is focused on aggression. Um, and uh, nobody likes aggression, so I always feel the need to explain why it's an important behavior for honeybees. Uh, there are a lot of reasons. So, as I'm going to show you today, the level of aggression that your hive is displaying tells you something about the predator risk in the environment. So, is it being disturbed? It also can tell you about the food availability in the environment. Uh, so it's this really interesting behavior that serves a dual purpose if you're paying attention. I mentioned a couple examples of the way that aggression is linked to disease. So we've shown that high aggression in general is associated with the positive health outcomes in the bee, um, with some exceptions. And I can talk about that with those of you who are interested, but that's a general trend that we've documented. Um, aggression is also linked to performance. So the bees that are aggressive in the hive are some of the older worker bees, the older bees that are also the, the foragers in the hive. Um, and that seems to be because the demands of flight associated with foraging are also beneficial if you're trying to attack a predator. So they have a physiological link to one another. So if you have a hive that's performing really well in terms of aggression, it probably also has high foraging activity. And then finally, from uh, interest in social behavior, as with humans, there's a cycle of aggression in honeybees. They are very heavily influenced by the level of aggression displayed by their nestmates and um, their experiences that they get either in terms of uh, predator threats or foraging activity. Uh, so this is a really flexible behavior. Sometimes we think of insects as being kind of like little machines 
where they're sort of they're stereotyped in the way that they behave, um, and it doesn't vary that much or it's fixed based on their genetic background. But that's not exactly true. So with something like aggression, it's a great example. The environment plays a really strong role in how the bees express aggression. It can tell you something about disease, it can tell you something about um, food resources or predation threat. So talking a little bit more about aggression and this transitioning to this robbing issue, um, it's important to note that bees are aggressive in kind of two different contexts. So remember in this case, we, we call this aggression, but really what we're talking about is nest defense, right? So the bees are defending their hives against some kind of threat. Um, one kind of major threat that's sort of iconic, you can see from this historic um, little uh, artwork here with these bee steps in the background, probably from Europe, um, these, uh, bees are being aggressive towards a large mammal, in this case a bear, a human would also fall in this category, but things like skunks and raccoons that might be trying to um, eat the bees or the honey inside the hut. So there's a specialized group of bees that are responsible for fending off this type of threat. Here they are, you can see them flying out and stinging the predator threat. These are called the soldier bees. So that's a name that we give them just because um, it designates them as a very specific group of individuals. Uh, one thing I'd like to talk a little bit about is how we measure aggression in honeybees. Because, uh, of course, we can do it systematically. Um, you kind of all know where your aggressive hives are, but it's nice to be able to document it uh, using numbers, right? Um, so uh, one way that we do this is by taking advantage of the fact that this behavior, this response to a large predator threat like a bear, is actually a highly coordinated activity. So one bee is not enough to get rid of a bear. You actually need, you need hundreds or sometimes thousands of individuals. This is what's called a collective behavior, kind of like schooling in fish. And it's socially uh, coordinated by a special alarm pheromone that bees release when they're disturbed. And you're probably also familiar with this if you spend any time around a beehive. Um, the alarm pheromone, it smells like bananas. That's why the structure here, of the major component, has little bananas in there. Um, the bees release this by sticking their stinger out, fanning their wings. They also release it when they sting you when the stinger comes out in your skin. And you can smell it. Well, most of you probably know. <laughs> so we can actually buy this pheromone from a chemical company pretty easily and use it to measure aggressive response for a hive. So this picture gives you an example of what we can do. So these top pictures show hive entrances, undisturbed in the morning, not very much bee traffic. Then we expose the entrance to a very small amount of this little chemical. We put it on a piece of filter paper, which you can see in the back there. The bees will respond to this cue by kind of bubbling out of the entrance. Um, if we don't do any kind of uh, visual disturbance, we don't wave our arms around or anything, they tend to just stay at the entrance like these bees here, and we can count the number of bees that come out. That's our measure of aggression. So very simple, uh, but then we've shown that this is a pretty uh, repeatable measure that's reliable. So a low aggression hive might have one or two bees come out, a high aggression hive will have hundreds of bees. So there's another really critical context for nest defense in bees, and this is directly related to the robbing issue. And this is defense against other honeybees. Um, this uh, defensive behavior is also the purview of a specialized group of bees called guards. Um, guards are bees that uh, stand at the colony entrance, they monitor the entrance for threats. If you watch them closely, you'll see they reach up and contact and sometimes wave their antenna at incoming foragers. They're smelling them to make sure that they're actually nestmates and not coming from another colony trying to steal honey. So the guard smells this returning forager, you can see her column there, and then decides whether she's going to let that be in the hive or reject that bee and kick it out because it's a possible invader. Um, this is a behavior that we also use to study aggression. Uh, we can measure it in the lab, which makes it a really nice, uh, easily controlled experiment. I just have a short video to show you what this is like. So basically, if we keep bees in a small group in a little petri dish, they develop an identity. They consider themselves to be colony mates. And they'll behave aggressively towards another bee that we stick in that dish with them. Um, and so we can count the uh, number of aggressive behaviors, biting this intruding bee, um, trying to sting it, those are measures of aggression. So in this video, if you keep your eye on this bee here, this is 
one of the group members, and this blur is the bee we stuck in from a different colony. Uh, it's going to run from left to right across the screen, and you'll see this group member jump up and attack it. And this is slowed down a little bit. But you can see she grabs her, pulls her to the ground, uh, bites her, tries to sting her. Some of the other bees become involved, some don't. So we can count those behaviors, and that's our measure of aggression using this acid. So that's how we measure aggression, but I wanted to emphasize here that honey robbing, this phenomenon where bees will go from one colony to the other, go in and try to steal honey, has had a strong impact on um, the uh, behaviors that have evolved in the honeybee. They have a specialized system of um, defending against other bees. They have a nestmate recognition system where they can use odor to detect friend from foe. Um, they also have a specialized group of bees, the guards, that are in charge of this job. So it's pretty sophisticated. Uh, and that's because honey robbing is such a strong pressure on the hive. Um, honey robbing actually can destroy a colony. So what is honey robbing? Um, this is a phenomenon where bees break into another colony and typically destroy it. So they're in there eating all of the honey that they can collect. Uh, but they're also fighting with the bees that own that colony, the victim hive. I put up some pictures to give you a sense of what robbing looks like. Uh, if you've never kind of seen it come to fruition, uh, it's going to be hard to explain. Um, but so, for example, uh, this, is, this might be what you see from the outside of a colony that's being robbed. Um, there's a lot of chaos here. There are uh, a lot of bees coming and going from the colony because there's a high level of recruitment uh, from this robbing hive to the victim hive. You see bees that are uh, around the colony, maybe trying to get into cracks. One of the features of robbing is these bees are coming from another hive, they're looking for alternative entrances, other ways into the colony where they can bypass the guards. Um, so you may see this kind of thing happening. You'll also see aggression about the entrance of the hive, and I'll show you a couple videos of that. So what happens inside? Well, they're going in to the comb, and they're ripping off the cappings on top of the uh, honey grains, right? So you can see a couple uh, capped honey cells here still remaining. But this is a very characteristic feature of robbing. If you open a hive and there's, it looks like someone ripped off the top of the comb um, on the honey frame, that frame is probably then robbed. Sometimes they'll completely destroy the wax and they'll just pile up in the bottom of the hive. And that's what's pictured here. You can see chunks of wax um, on the ground right at the entrance. Um, the major outcome of honey robbing, of course, is that the victim hive is typically killed. Um, so you may see dead bees outside the entrance um, or piling up around the entrance. And if you go inside this hive, uh, if, uh, after a full robbing event, the bees will all be dead. Uh, may or may not be present themselves. So. so this is a destructive behavior on the part of the robbers um, where they are, uh, they're making these, they're basically killing these victim hives. So, as Kennedy was mentioning, this is a pretty destructive behavior from the standpoint of a beekeeper. You lose this victim colony um, and uh, everything that goes along with that. And I don't think I need to justify why losing a hive this is important. Okay, so just to review the behavioral features of robbing, because um, these are things that you can look for when you see a colony in your bee yard that you suspect uh, something weird is going on. So the first thing that I wanted to point out is casting at the colony entrance. So casting flight, some people call this snooping. It actually looks like a bee is flying around and kind of trying to figure out where it can get in. Um, it's actually very similar to um, threats you may have uh, received around your mail. If you have a honeybee just sort of buzzing around your face and annoying you, it looks very similar to that, except it's directed towards the hive entrance. So that casting behavior, snooping, is often a bee from another hive that is considering uh, uh, instigating robbing. I mentioned alternative entrance seeking. This behavior where they're kind of looking for cracks and other ways in, where they can bypass the guards. That's another very classic feature of robbing. And that is not something you would typically see with a normal hive. A normal forager is going to have a main entrance. Um, oh, and also, normal foragers typically go right in and right out of the hive. They're not doing the stooping kind of flight. The other telltale feature, which I put third, because it can be hard to tell if you have a really strong colony that forages really well, um, the, one of the features of robbing is massive recruitment. So
So the, the high that's doing the routing is, of course, going home and telling its nestmates about this very nice resource it found using the vital dance. Um, and so it's bringing a lot of bees to come and help to take advantage of this food resource and to fight and kill the victim hive bees. So there's a lot of recruitment, and you see a lot of workers going in and out. And often, if you have a small hive that's being robbed, um, this is very clearly disproportionate to, to the size of that hive. These aren't normal foragers. <clears throat> okay, so why rob? Um, this, this might be uh, kind of obvious at this point, but honey is more valuable than nectar to bees for a few reasons. Um, one, if you think about collecting nectar, you're, you have to get it from individual flowers. This is a resource that's scattered across the landscape. Um, it takes a lot of time and energy to go around each flower and fill in on nectar. Flat, our flowers and nectar also are about, uh, it contain about 20% sugar. When you look at what's actually inside nectar, um, it's a low concentration of sugar compared to um, honey, which is about 80% sugar. Um, it's also a large concentrated resource in one area. But I put this last point because I think it's interesting. But if you collect uh, nectar from an individual flower, it's one type of nectar, um, also called monofloral. Honey, though, is typically a composite of a lot of different nectar types. And it's well known that bees like diversity in their diet. So if you go and rob honey, you're actually getting um, somebody's concentrated that resource for you. And it's a high value mix resource, too. Okay, so honey's super valuable. Uh, more valuable than nectar, easier to get, uh, and you know you have these neighboring beehives that have hundreds of pounds of honey in some cases. Um, so why not rob? Um, and I think the biggest, uh, one of the biggest arguments against it is just the cost of the fighting, right? So they're going in these hives, they have to fight with the guard bees, they risk dying. And in fact, um, there's evidence that uh, when bees experience a predator threat at a flower, they actually go back to the hive and tell bees to stop dancing for that food location. So they're averse to going to forage at places where they're at risk. That's, that's well known. So um, what's interesting about uh, robbing is that experience of robbing does change how this victim hive behaves. So one of the things they do is they post more guards during a robbing event. So that's what's going on in this picture here. So if you look at the number of guards at the entrance, you just look and count them. Um, these are different hives. You can see the hives have different numbers of guards for a variety of reasons. But what this uh, study showed is that when these hives are experiencing robbing, they post more guards at the entrance. So they are responding. They're not just kind of a latent victim that's laying there and, and letting uh, these guys come and bait. They're putting up a fight, and that's costly. Um, so I have a couple of videos here. Uh, I haven't presented with these before, so I hope they're visible. Um, but these are showing basic aggressive behaviors against potential robbers at the nest entrance. And I wanted to show these to give you an idea of what these behaviors look like, what you can look for for robbing. And you'll notice that they're actually very similar to what I showed you in that other video, um, since that assay reflects this behavior as well. So I think the top one is going to play, no. I think the bottom one plays first. So here, this is the target of this aggression. This is the bee trying to get into this hive. And you'll see we have several guards that are reacting to this bee uh, with some low-level aggressive behavior. So they're smelling her, they're pulling on her legs, they're biting her, um, generally threatening her, right? So this looks really uh, subtle. You know, that's a kind of low-level of aggression. But if you're paying close attention, you can see that and, and be aware that there's a threat. This top video is showing some higher level aggressive behaviors where bees are actually trying to sting this intruder. Um, this is, uh, this video slowed down a little bit, so um, it doesn't look as frenetic, but it would be if it was a husky. Um, so up here, you can see, so this is the victim again in the middle. She's being dragged out. You can see this um, bee is attempting to sting her. She's got her abdomen curved, and if you look closely, her stinger comes out. So um, these behaviors, if you pay attention, you can actually uh, prevent robbing. So I'll show you some data about that. But um, essentially, uh, there's a recent study um, that Tom Sealy put out showing that um, these types of aggressive behaviors escalate preceding in the days preceding robbing. So if you're paying attention, you may be able to stop it by paying attention to the behaviors. So there are other costs to robbing we found recently. So this is my student Grayson in the field. 
field, we have these experimental colonies um, where we actually artificially induce robbing um, by having these bees learn to visit uh, a small nucleus hive that had honey frames in them. In this case, we didn't have these frames guarded by bees. We found that if we put, we even gave them unexposed honey frames, um, they demonstrated the same typical guarding behaviors, the casting, the alternative entrance seeking, and the high recruitment level. So what we did was we allowed these hives to rob. So now we're not the victims, they're the robbers. And then we looked at how that hive behaved when the robbers came home. And we found uh, something really interesting, which is that when you come back to your hive and you've been robbing, you actually face greater aggression from your guards. Uh, they somehow know that you've been robbing or there's a confusion of the cues that they use to identify their nestmate, such that they reach out to you at a higher rate than a typical nestmate that they kind of pull out into the hive, typically on the street. So that's another cost. You may get booted out and never be able to come home. That's a problem. Um, and one of the keys to robbing, I think, in understanding it and preventing it, is to realize that the costs and benefits of robbing vary at different times of the year. It's not always the same. So, um, for example, one pattern that is abundantly clear is that there's increased robbing with decreased floral resources. And I'll show you an example of a study that uh, tried to get at this idea. So what these guys did, this was uh, this is a study set in Florida, and they basically monitored guarding behaviors at the colony entrance when there was heavy citrus bloom, so a lot of nectar flow, plenty of food, and then the time preceding that where there wasn't very much uh, floral resource availability. So because this is in Florida, this was in February and March, so it's not super relevant to our time frame, but it's a cool example. So the way that they monitored the availability of food in this study was to look at the um, sugar concentrations that bees were willing to collect from feeders. So this, this is a timeline here um, over February and March of this particular year. Basically what they find, when there are fewer flowers available, bees become a lot less picky about the uh, sugar they'll collect from feeders. When, it's, when there are more flowers available, they will only collect that sugar at really high concentrations. A high concentration means it's a more valuable resource. They would prefer to collect food from flowers, and so it's hard to lure them to a feeder. Um, so this is an interesting way of assessing the kind of degree of desperation that these bees are facing in the environment trying to find flowers. So when they look across this same timeline and guarding behavior, they find that it matches this change in pickiness and this risk of robbing. So um, when there are fewer flowers earlier preceding the bloom of these guys, there are more guards. This is a couple different eight years. Then the number of guards declines as uh, there are more flowers blooming because the robbing risk is going down. Uh, similarly, this was kind of cool, they looked at um, the rate at which these guards actually accept or reject a bee. So uh, how picky are they about letting their bees into the hive? Um, they find that they accept their nestmates at a pretty high rate no matter what, but they're more likely to kick out these non-nestmates um, at the robbing time period. And they're more permissive, so they actually just let these non-nestmates into the hive when there's a lot of food availability in the environment because there's low risk of robbing. So it's really interesting. So, you know, the, whether or not an enemy coming in is going to steal your food depends directly on the, the risk uh, in the environment because of the floral resource availability. So that's a little surprising from my opinion. Okay, so this was Florida, and I mentioned they have a weird timeline for seasonality. But um, in most places, you know, there's a lot of new data coming out on nutrition availability and the landscape, rural resources across a lot of the United States. And the general consensus um, is that there's a late summer dearth period for nectar most places throughout the U.S. So um, at least in the East, Midwest, Plain States, Eastern United States. So this late summer, early fall period is the time of nectar shortage, and that is true here in Kentucky as well. Um, they have found sort of nationwide almost, or at least in the eastern states, that this dirt period typically corresponds to the end of the clover bloom. So that white clover bloom is really tracks um, uh, for resources, and then when it's done, in a lot of places, that means there isn't food available. Um, so this is some data from uh, Tom Seeley's group that was recently published. They looked at robin observations over time, and sure enough, you can see mid to late September here, uh, when floral resources are really uh, declined, 
you see this onset of grounding activity. It's so that's really not happening at all earlier in the season when there's plenty of food. Um, and here, interestingly, these circles represent aggressive behaviors they observe at the entrance, and the squares represent um, robbing incidences. So you can see, again, the aggressive behavior predicts the robbing. Um, I wanted to point out that you can kind of do a quick and dirty version of that feeder experiment I was telling you about. If your bees are taking sugar water during the summer or late summer fall, that probably means that their resource abundance is low. Okay, so you may have noticed if you try to feed your bees in the spring that they're less likely to take sugar water because there are plenty of flowers around in the environment. Um, they prefer to collect nectar over sugar. Um, so, you know, this is a way to test uh, what's going on uh, for your hives. If they're, if they're rapidly taking sugar, you may want to be more careful about the problem. Okay. So let's talk about another cost of robbing, which is uh, related to disease. Um, and this, this makes this phenomenon even more irritating. Uh, so you lose a hive, but then you also have some other uh, ancillary costs. Okay, so the first clue that robbing and disease are linked is that victim hives are often small or dead. <laughs> okay, so these are not typically healthy hives that are being robbed. A typical hive can fend off this robbing threat. Um, they may be small because they're sick, so that means there's a disease risk. Um, and a burden of transferring disease. So the data I've been showing you throughout from um, Tom Seeley's, uh, this is a recent publication from his group, um, I thought it was interesting because uh, it really addresses this particular question of how mite bombs are working, right? So many of you, if you've been keeping these at all, hopefully have heard of the varroa mite. I'm sure you'll hear a lot about it today. Um, but this is this large parasitic mite that lives on the bees. Um, if you have colonies that have a high level of mites and the colony dies, there's this phenomenon where they tend to spread to other hives. And in fact, if you look at colony density at the landscape level, more uh, dense honeybee hives, typically um, in those landscapes, you have higher mite loads per hive. So um, what Tom is trying to figure out here is whether these mite bombs are acting through drift or through robbing. So drift is this accidental movement of bees across colonies that are nearby, although bees can accidentally find the hives up to 300 meters away. So in drifting, you know, we typically think on a small scale, like a few meters, uh, but it can occur at a larger scale too. But the other possibility, of course, is that these hives die, and when they get robbed out, the bees are going in and picking up mites. Um, and so he did an experiment where he set up these donor hives. These were high-density uh, mite colonies. They had a ton of mites. Then he put receiver colonies at various distances from the donors. And he looked at how those receiver colonies showed changes in mite numbers over time. And I won't go through all the details here, but essentially looking at either mites on bees or mite drops below the hive, um, this dashed line indicates the onset of robbing, where the receiver colonies went and robbed the dying um, mite donor colonies. They weren't doing very well, unsurprisingly. Um, and what he sees is a spike in mite loads um, that occur uh, after this rally event. That doesn't explain numbers, but it's part of it. Uh, and by the way, this dotted line is the onset of aggressive behavior. So again, you have you know, a couple day window between aggression and robbing. So basically what they conclude here is that both drift and robbing play a role in mite transfer, but importantly, robbing is playing a role. Um, robbing is also known to spread American fowl brood, which hopefully you've heard of. Um, this is uh, one of the nastiest uh, pathogens you can get in your beehive. Um, typically, this, your, well, the requirement is to destroy the hive if you have American fowl brood, uh, because the spores are so good at, um, at, at survival and moving among colonies. So this study that showed that hives that are less than two kilometers apart are at risk of um, robbing and American fowl brood transfer. That's actually pretty far. I don't have a lot of conversion, but two kilometers is not a short distance. Um, in general, there are other pathogens, of course, to think about. Um, viruses could spread in this way as well, um, but it depends on the virulence of the virus, meaning sort of how potent it is, and how the virus is transmitted from B to B. And I'll talk a lot about viruses in a session later today if you're interested in learning about that. Um, one interesting feature of robin is that robin hives are typically strong. These are hives that have a lot of foragers. Um, they can mount a strong attack on a victim hive. 
But if you look at who the robbing individual youth are, sometimes these are actually some of the sicker or older foragers, which again increases this probability of disease transmission. I've got to pick up the pace here. Um, so this figure, basically what they did is uh, they collected foraging bees that were either robbing, that's the gray, or foragers that were just normal foragers. And uh, these little dots and lines show you differences in longevity for those groups. Basically what they see here is that um, these uh, robbers tend to live for shorter time periods, so they have a, a shorter lifespan. Um, if you look at their guts at their nocemal levels, they also find that robbers have a higher number of nocema spores. So uh, this was evidence that they are kind of sicker bees that are doing the robbing. Okay, so um, one of the most confounding issues with robbing, and, and Tammy mentioned this, is that this, it's a cycle that's really hard to break. So there is evidence that once a hive starts robbing, it's actually difficult to get them to stop and go back to sort of normal food collection. And as to why is an open question, a really interesting one. Um, but, you know, so this is uh, from uh, the Honey Biology book, Winston's uh, famous book published in the 80s. Um, and this is just a statement he makes that basically when they, a robber leaves one victim of mine, they tend to go and snoop at other hives, right? They don't just go home, they keep up the sort of dirty work. Um, as my, uh, one of my advisors used to say, they develop a taste for it, okay? So they're, they're sort of bad actors. Um, why is that? So uh, once a, war, a robber, always a robber. Um, we tried to get at this question a little bit by looking at the brains of robbers. Um, so basically what we do here um, is we measure uh, genes that are active in the brain, and we know that these genes and their activity levels predict aggressive behavior in these bees. So we collected a bunch of robbing bees and normal foragers, and we compared their brains. And we essentially, when we look at these different genes, I won't go into details, but these are, they differ between robbers and normal foragers. And when you look at the patterns of how they differ, Robbers actually look like soldier bees. So they look like this specialized, aggressive bee. Um, why is that? Uh, it could be that they are sort of uh, inherently more aggressive. It could be that they're responding to an environmental cue that um, instigates aggression in certain individuals. It could be because they go and, and are participating in these fights, and we know that fighting actually enhances a bee's aggressive level. So there are a lot of explanations, but it's um, interesting that they're more aggressive than typical forager bees which could be why they're very persistent in going from high to high. The other thing to remember as a beekeeper is that honeybees have really good memories. Uh, foragers remember the location of food resources. And remember, they remember this, remember, remember, yes. So they remember this information. They go home. They communicate it to other foragers using the live events, right? So um, there is a, a process of learning and memory here. There's evidence that bees can remember good food resources uh, for their entire lives, so up to 30 days. If you're a late season forager that lives till the following spring, you could remember the location of a food resource the following spring. Um, so they are more likely to return to high value food resources, and honey is a great example. Um, they're also more likely to dance for those food resources, which is why they recruit so many bees. So you have a robin hive, they, uh, a lot of bees have participated in it. They've gone and, and done the task themselves. We know they're more aggressive. We know they're really good for remembering. So you now have a kind of bad actor workforce. They get to contact with for the rest of the season and possibly for the following year. Um, one of the other really troubling features of robbing is that it has this tendency to spread anecdotally at least. So one hive becomes a robbing hive, then another hive in the apiary starts robbing another one. Um, which is part of why it's difficult to contain. Um, one possibility, we don't, again, we don't know why, but this could be because bad actors, these robbers, are drifting among hives. So remember, when a robber comes home, it's more likely to get rejected from his own colony than a non-robbing would be. And so it gets booted out, and it might just go down the line and try to get into the next hive. Um, and if, if it becomes an active forager in that hive, it still has this robbing tendency, then it will then communicate that to its neighbor. So that's an idea. I don't know if uh, data to show that yet, but uh, that might be one way that robbing is spreading. So one of the issues here too is the exact cues that instigate a hive to rob and to continue robbing are not really well known. 
So I've mentioned a few possibilities, but we don't know exactly what individuals are responding to. So it seems to be a combination of things. Um, ecological conditions, food availability, bailing cues, it could be they're using the environment to, to decide to rob. Um, it could be that they're using their aggressive interactions with other hives to decide they want to start robbing. Um, they may be able to perceive changes in the store of food in a colony. So they may be able to sense that their hive is losing honey. Uh, for example, it's known that um, foragers are able to detect pollen levels in the hive, and that changes their um, how much pollen they collect. Um, it's also possible if you have foraging inactivity and a high population of just listless bees that are inside the hive not doing anything, but that somehow triggers problems as well. Um, I only mention that because we've seen, for example, in some of our hottest bee yards where the, the temperature is the highest, we see um, greater robbing risk. So it could be inside there just getting right the gas yes, on some level. And of course, the level of available unguarded honey is key here. The experience of eating honey triggers the behavior. Okay, so how to minimize this or prevent it. I've harped on this a couple times, but pay attention to the behavior the entrance of your hive. Do you see aggression? Fighting at the entrance predicts robbing. Um, be aware of variation in colony strength in your apiaries. Do you have nucleus colonies in large hives together, specifically during the robbing season? Um, nucleus colonies aren't necessarily sick, but they are small, so they'll be targeted by the sure hives if there's not enough food available. So be aware of food availability. Is it the time of year of nectar dearth? Drought conditions can exacerbate that problem. And as I mentioned, you can do a mini experiment. See if your eyes take sugar syrup. If they're not taking it at all, there's probably plenty of food around. Um, if you are perceiving a risk of robbing, you can temporarily either completely close the entrance of the hive or reduce it, make it smaller, make it less area for the guards to defend. Um, you also want to minimize unguarded food. So, for example, if you've extracted honey, you have wet supers, put those on in the evening so that the, the foraging activity is low. Um, because wet supers on a hive can actually trigger that hive to start robbing. People have found that to be the case. Um, you also want to cover open hives and put them in the bee yard. If you're working in a colony, put a lid on top of a box instead of just leaving it open to the rest of the yard. Um, you can also work late in the day during robbing period. So right before sunset, which is basically, you know, the bees are going to bed. They're not going to start the robbing activity next time. Alright, um, so that's uh, all I have for you. These are just collaborators and people that support this work. Um, I have a couple minutes for questions, I think, before the next session starts. Yeah? How long does it take, once the robin begins, how long does it take for a healthy colony to have been robbed in the collapse? Uh, it depends on, so the question was, how long does it take to, for the victim to be completely robbed out? Depends on the size of the hive. Uh, it, you could, it could happen within an hour, easily. Yeah, it's a small colony, like a nucleus colony. Yeah, so that's part of our prevention is really key. Yeah. Do you find one breed more likely to rob than another? Um, we've not uh, looked at that question specifically. There are some differences among strains and aggression and aggressive levels. Um, I'm hesitant to comment on which ones you know are which because the source where you get them, the, the specific genetics make a difference. Uh, there's some variation in the Russian, yeah. Yeah. Does Robin always have to be aggressive or violent? Can there be a low grade type of Robin from one half to another? Um, that's a good question. So, as I mentioned, in our experiments where we artificially induce Robin, we don't even use a victim hive with bees in it, we just use honey. And um, I've suspected that that ex experience of collecting honey at a time of year where there's not a lot of food may actually be beneficial to the robin hive, that um, there's a nutritional benefit or a physiological benefit. Um, so I would call that low level robin on some, some level. Uh, from one hive to the next, where there are actually bees, I don't know. Um, so they don't, they don't always completely rob them out, if that's your question. So sometimes you'll see some damage, but the, the colony's okay, or you'll see a few dead bees. Uh, so sometimes the victim hive wins, they get more than long. Yeah.